So we're ready for part four of reproductive strategies, sexual selection. We're looking at different models of female choice, why females are choosy, what adaptation or what um, what's the adaptive value of being choosy. And we've gone through several models already. We've talked about the uh, direct benefits model. Females are choosy because they gain direct benefits that will increase their survivorship or their offspring's survivorship. We've looked at the good genes hypothesis, which says females should select traits that um, indicate the male they're mating with has good quality genes, is a good, healthy male, because their offspring will inherit those good quality genes. And then there's the runaway selection model. This one is really strange. I'm going to um, pop us out here so our slide is a little bit bigger. The runaway selection model goes something like this. Okay. Um, the, the short end of it is female preferences increase over time as the male trait increases. Okay, so let's think about this for a minute. Initially, let's suppose that a female prefers uh, males with a particular trait that indicates good survival viable value. So in my diagram down here, um, maybe there's a survival advantage of having a long tail. Right? And so natural selection has selected over time for these males that have slightly longer tails. That's the survival advantage. At some point, a, there's a, at some point, a genetic link arises in which the female prefers males that have these long tails. And this would be essentially um, a good genes hypothesis. All right, now females prefer males that have long tails. That indicates they have good quality. Their offspring will have these nice long tails. That's good. But here's the runaway selection. And I'm going to draw this out as well. If we think about, let's see, a graph of this. If we're looking at the male trait over here and of like tail length in, in these birds or in peacocks or whatever we're looking at. And then we're looking down here at the female preference. What happens essentially is once the preference for tail length has arisen, then we see uh, uh, that there's a survival advantage and a sexual selection advantage to having longer tails. So males should develop longer and longer tails because natural selection and sexual selection are operating together and um, males that have the longer tails are doing better. They're surviving better, they're getting more mates, that's a good thing, right? And so here we've got, you know, the optimal tail length. But in runaway selection, the female preference and the male trait become linked to each other and run away with each other, even though that trait eventually doesn't indicate a better ability to survive or, or have good genes. So over time, because females still prefer long tails, uh, the tail length of males gets longer and longer and longer. And so we see something that looks like this. The tail length, as the male tail length gets longer, the female preference gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And so we see a longer and longer tail that's being selected for, even though the trait of tail length, even though the, the tail length doesn't indicate good survivorship anymore. So like with peacocks, having a giant, beautiful, beautifully ornamented tail isn't good for survivorship, but perhaps the female preference for a tail length and tail length ran away together, co-evolved over time, and um, eventually we've got female preference driving the evolution of the trait. The trait is um, no longer um, adaptive from a natural selection point of view at all, but these two traits are linked together, female preference and male trait, linked together, stuck together, if you will. So here's a test of the runaway selection model um, to see if it makes any sense. And the test involves these adorable looking stalk-eyed flies that have eyes at the end of these long stalks. And it turns out that in this species, females prefer to mate with males that have really long stalks, their eyes on the ends of long stalks. And researchers are wondering why. Well, perhaps it's the result of a good genes hypothesis, like it's a result of, you know, males have, that have these long stalks have good quality genes, 
or perhaps it's the result of um, runaway selection. There may have been strong selection on the male trait of eye stalk length, but this selection of male eye stalk length could have been affected by or driven by uh, female preference. With females, the female preference for eye stalk length being connected to or stuck with, if you will, or running away with the male trait of, of long eye stalks. So Wilkinson and others decided to set up, and this is an old study, like from the early 90s, a 13 generation experiment with three different groups of flies. He's doing an artificial experiment, uh, artificial selection experiment here. And you're going to allow animals to breed for 13 generations and look at the length of eye stalks in the males at the end of these 13 generations. So um, first he has a control group in which he allows the animals to breed randomly. And we might predict that after 13 generations, we should still see males having uh, long eye stalks and females preferring long eye stalks. So the female preference would prefer long. And that's what they found, all right? And in another group, they artificially um, selected males that had the longest eye stalks each generation and kept breeding them. And so over time, you've got generations of males that have longer and longer eye stalks. What about the female preference? In the runaway selection model, if female preference and eye stalk length are connected, are linked together, then we should expect females to prefer the long eye stalks too. And they did, okay? They preferred the long eye stalks too. All right, so that's good. But here's the kicker. It's it, this, I think it's this, um, particular group that helps us understand the difference between runaway selection and possible good genes model. So now they decided for 13 generations to select males that have the shortest eye stalks, to, to have shorter and shorter and shorter eye stalks. So by the end of the 13th generation, they got some pretty short eye stalked males. If females prefer to mate with males that have long eye stalks because of good quality, because that shows good quality um, males, then females still should prefer long eye stalks. But if the trait of female preference and male eye stalk length has co-evolved together, then we would expect females to prefer the short eyed, short stalked males, if you will. And that's what happened. Females began to prefer shorter and shorter stalks. This preference of female female preference for eye stalk length and the trait of eye stalk length kind of linked together. They were stuck together. They ran away, if you will, together. And so this occasionally happens, we think, too, in um, different populations, different species. So if we wanted to, we could compare each model for the evolution of mate choice. That would help us understand um, or be able to make predictions about which mechanism which evolutionary mechanism led to a particular version of mate choice. So there's three models, direct benefits, good genes, or runaway selection. In the direct benefits model, females should prefer a trait that is a large direct benefit to the female's ability to survive or reproduce. So a tangible resource that means that's going to influence her ability to survive. Why is this adaptive? <laughs> because it increases her ability to survive or it increases her ability to produce young. In the good genes model, females should prefer a trait that indicates good quality males, males that have good viability. Whether that's, you know, red color or long tail or whatever. The primary adaptive value to choosy females is her sons and daughters inherit that good quality trait as well. Her sons and daughters inherit the ability to resist parasites or the um, good quality genes that enable them that, to grow well and be successful. In the runaway selection model, females should prefer a trait that is, I guess, sexually attractive, right? Um, some sexually attractive trait. The primary adaptive value to choosy females, why would this be worth it? Because her sons 
might inherit that sexy trait, if you will, that makes them attractive to females, and her sons would be more successful reproducing down the road. This is called the sexy son hypothesis, and this leads to the runaway, running away of this trait with female preference, and that's why it fits under the runaway selection model. So these are some models for how uh, female choosiness could have evolved over time, different ways. Um, what about females, um, human females? Are we choosy in who we select or prefer to mate with? Well, David Buss, again, has done all sorts of research on mate choice in humans and has found over uh, a variety of cultures and times that females are choosy. And there are some traits that stand out. Females prefer to mate with males with more resources or more earning potential. This would be an example of maybe a direct benefits model. Females prefer males who are healthy, have large body size, have strength. This might be a good genes hypothesis, right? Oh, that male has good genes. My offspring are going to have good genes who are healthy. Females who are, males who are intelligent. This probably goes more with the good genes model. Um, females prefer males who have the ability to protect her children and provide for them. Oh, that's definitely a direct benefits model, right? And these preferences are kind of universal across all different cultures. It's kind of interesting. Have they evolved via the same mechanisms that, that um, choosiness has evolved in other species? Maybe. Finally, there are sometimes constraints on sexual selection, and particularly on female choice. Sometimes females can't choose to mate with specific males. Female choice is not always a choice, if you will. Their choice is constrained by some other factors. So let me give you an example. In the Langer monkeys, remember, um, sometimes females' infants are killed by an invading male. Uh, a new male that enters the territory kills their offspring, or their, I'm sorry, kills the female's young by infanticide, right? At this point, uh, females typically become sexually receptive and then mate with those same invading males after the death of her um, of her unweaned infant, right? This seems like an odd choice to us, but it's constrained. It's imposed upon her by the male's behavior. Given a choice, the Langer females would certainly continue raising her young that she's already raised. They've been killed. This nullifies the female's earlier choice of a male. And female, at, after her young has been killed, has not too many other choices. She probably has to mate with the male who's dominant in the area. And so she's going to mate with the male who killed her infant earlier. It's a choice that's constrained um, or, or, or limited. She doesn't really have a lot of choices. This is her best choice under the, situ under the circumstances. There's more information about um, fruit flies and choices uh, that are constrained in fruit flies in our textbook. So you can take a look at that. I think page 49 talks a lot about fruit fly um, constraints in female mate choice. Uh, it could be that female choice is constrained because natural selection is also operating. So in golden hamsters and prairie dogs, remember that sometimes these animals will either kill their members of their litter, call their litter, or even just abandon their litter, right? This typically happens when there is no other choice. Um, the mom faces uh, a trade-off, essentially. The, this is kind of the best situation in light of the conditions. So um, conditions are bad um, with hamsters. Maybe there's not enough food. We have to cut. Uh, they have no choice other than to, um, to essentially not take care of their young so that they can survive to breed for another day. Or with prairie dogs, they choose to um, breed under the gamble that the dominant female might die before they give birth. But what if the dominant female doesn't die? then prairie dogs um, essentially make the choice to stop um, investing, if you will, because they are in no condition to continue investing in their offspring. Humans are constrained 
uh, constrained as well in female choice. Um, constraints might be as simple as hormonal cycles. Women in their mid-cycle, in the follicular phase of their cycle, for example, are much more easily aroused and are more likely to engage in sexual activity, more likely to get pregnant as well. And here's another situation. Sometimes one status or social group that you live in constrains you. So upper class women in China from way back in the 12th century all the way through the 20th century um, had um, parents who arranged marriages. Females don't have a choice then on who to mate with. They've also um, practiced, and that's common still today in many cultures, right? Uh, they also practice something um, called foot binding. You've probably heard about it. I don't think there's anyone alive that had it happen anymore. But um, basically, when girls were young, their bones of their feet were like, uh, their, their, their feet were bound with um, wrappings that became tighter and tighter and tighter, which essentially crushed the bones of their feet. And their feet would be tiny, but they would also be crippled from this um, foot binding. They couldn't walk very far because it was so painful to walk on their crushed feet. And this essentially prevented wanderlust. You can't mate with someone else because you can't go anywhere to mate with someone else. This is a serious constraint on female choice. Okay? Constraints occur. That is the end of this video. Whew. That was a long one, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, though, because it's kind of interesting material, in my opinion.